I'm Dr. Sheila Ryan Barnett. I'm an associate professor of anesthesiology at Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And I'm a chief medical officer at Beth Israel Deaconess Milton Hospital, part of Beth Israel Leahy Health. I have no financial disclosures, but I did want to mention that I am the ASA Chair of the Committee on Performance and Outcomes, and that does work on developments of measures for anesthesiologists and monitors' performance. In addition, I'm a board member of the Anesthesia Quality Institute. My objectives today are to review CMS structure, try to make it interesting, look at individual anesthesia measures, MIPS and recent performance data, to look to review hospital CMS measures, and then you know, begin to discuss a little bit about where is the anesthesiology hospital overlap, overlap or is there a place for opportunity? First of all, just to remind everybody that our um, healthcare system in the United States is CMS, and the CMS website is excellent if you are curious to learn more about it, um, and that this funds both Medicare and Medicaid. Purpose of today, I'm going to talk mostly about Medicare. Medicare dollars, as we all know from the news, are vast. The, hospital, the nation spends trillions of dollars on health care. And I really just want to point out for purposes of today is that about 20 or 30 percent is on physicians and clinical services and about 35 percent on hospital care. So those are the dollars at stake that we're really talking about what quality or value-based care can impact. And then on the right here specifically, you'll see that health insurance in the United States is about 20 to 30 percent, and this goes to hospitals for their reimbursement too, is for Medicare versus other private interface payers and different payers. But Medicare is still, even though it's not always the dominant payer for hospitals or individual physicians, it's still a very important, um, important source of income and finance. Back um, after the Affordable Care Act was introduced in 2015, we introduced the, the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. This is MACRA. You've probably heard of this. And then basically, this is what CMS implemented to go to a value-based incentive program, which is called the Quality Payment Program, which emphasized quality over volume. And there's two ways that physician, physicians can participate. They can either and we're going to talk about those two in a moment. Um, just to review value-based U.S. healthcare, it's both physicians and hospitals. Financial bonuses and penalties exist. It's very complex and, require, and requires a robust system of quality reporting, whether that's individual or in your hospitals. And even though we are now emphasizing very much quality over volume, as anesthesiologists, we have to always remember that we also bring an incredible value to, the, to institutions and to hospitals when we encourage or allow more high quality volume. Taking good care of patients efficiently in anesthesia and allowing surgeries to proceed without problems um, is an enormous benefit that anesthesiologists bring. And I think this, the uh, surgical home program is a really good example of how anesthesiologists can really enhance care for individuals. The value-based programs we're going to look at a little bit today include MACRA, which I just mentioned, and this impacts hospitals that we'll talk about their p penalties and bonuses, and also individuals, which we're going to talk about now in the MIPS program. So today I'm going to talk, Medicare is divided into the four parts, and I'm going to be talking today about part, this first about part B, and then we'll talk about part A. Part B is the physicians. So for all of us as physicians, um, and physicians or providers, um, Medicare does expect us to participate. There's two ways, either in MIPS, which is the Merit-Based Incentive Payment Program, or the Individual Program, or the Advanced APMs, which is the Alternate Payment Models. And many of us actually probably participate in APMs. This is multiple medical groups. I know I do it being part of a major health system um, or, or an academic center. And the clinicians then participate through the APMs. And as anesthesiologists, that often means that our group submits numbers on us, but many of those measures relate more to primary care or to other, out, um, other outcomes that may or may not be directly relevant to anesthesia. But we still participate in the bonus or in the penalties. So that is APM. So you may or may not be aware of that 
depending on how closely involved you are in your quality reporting programs. For those that do not participate in MIP, in APMs, you must participate in MIPs. You have to participate in something according to Medicare. And then the merit-based incentive payment system um, provides payment based on four final performance categories. These are quality, cost, improvement activities, and promoting interoperability. More and more, Medicare is moving a little bit away from quality, more towards cost and promoting interoperability. If you are MIPS eligible, if you take care of enough Medicare patients, basically $90,000 a year in allowed charges, or you look after at least 200, and you look after 200 Medicare patients, um, and that you provide more than 200 professional services covered. Not all anesthesiologists will make these in thresholds individually, and there are ways that they can combine with other physicians or other groups so that they can be eligible. The most important thing I think about CMS and payments and, and, and these sort of financial things is CMS sets a budget and then it stays with it. It means that everything it does is budget neutral. What that means for us is if you make, if you get money out of MIPS, it some, means someone else in the MIPS program lost money. So as you can see here, there's the maximum adjustments in 2019, about four or five percent, not huge numbers. But going forward, these numbers get bigger and bigger, up to 10%. And this is the Medicare amount that's adjusted back to a clinician. And as anesthesiologists, we don't always get that much back from Medicare, so this really reduces the dollars that are available. And the potential maximum adjustment will increase every year from now on um, through the next few years. The bonus, unfortunately, is paid by the poor performers. So it really is winners and losers. So the people that get the 9%, it meant they didn't, that there's some others that lost 9%. This is data that was fairly recent. Remember, the program was only introduced in about 2017. And what they found was that exceptional performers that came out of a separate pot were a pretty significant group here that would get extra dollars, but the bottom performers lost so that those in the top performance could gain. So it's really important to understand that there's winners and losers. If somebody's winning, it means someone else lost some. This is just some data from 2017, because the program was only introduced in 15. We're still getting the data now, and it was interrupted by COVID, and they did put some, um, some restrictions in there so the people that were unable to report got a buy for the year. But what happened was the first year, they allowed everyone to join, really, um, with very low, and it was a very low bar you had to reach. So almost everybody got a positive or neutral payment with very, very little negative. So what this meant was, even if you were a winner, there wasn't much to win because there was very few people that got a negative adjustment. And the maximum rewards actually declined from 2019 to 20, and as you can see, they were very small percentages. In 2021, the maximum for clinicians, and this is mostly primary care that may have many more Medicare patients than us and get significantly more professional Part B income, about $6,000 a clinician for an average of $130,000 of Medicare-only income. So small numbers um, and very challenging to reach. Um, they have done a lot of reviews over the last couple of years on how do physicians feel about MIPS. This wasn't anesthesiologist specifically, but basically it's not a very popular program. Many uh, physicians interviewed didn't actually understand about MACRA. Um, there, there was a strong feeling that most measures are available for primary care, but much less for general, uh, primary and general care and general surgery, but not a lot else for subspecialties. And leaders were very conflicted on whether MIPS improved any sort of patient care or not because there was such a focus on getting the quality numbers. There's a substantial administrative burden um, and the incentives were small. So there was some, so there's a lot of work and review going on on the MIPS program. CMS did acknowledge that the payments were incredibly low. They had a very higher participation rate in 2015-16 because they made it very easy to participate. They also set a very low threshold bar of only 30. It gets up to 75 now next year. So it was very easy to participate in the first phase of this program. It's going to be much harder as time goes on. But CMS now, they really do want to incorporate, push, pay, uh, 
providers more and more to working together and to working with hospitals. So CMS is now introducing something new called, or has introduced the MIPS program, which is the MIPS Value Pathway Program. This is basically additive on MIPS. And it basically brings you a little bit closer to the APM. So we're all in it together, the hospital and the providers. What the MIPS value pathways do is they bring in your current MIPS, so those individual score, individual measures you may be scored on, and then they add in the foundation layer. The foundation layer is the hospital measures, such as readmission that we'll talk about, and potentially in the future, hacks or hospital acquired conditions and such. So this is really entwining then the hospitals with the providers very closely. So it becomes increasingly important as anesthesiologists that we understand what is driving those foundational levels and how can we contribute to keep those scores as high as possible. Um, last year, we were actually fortunate to be one of six or seven um, in the country that applied to CMS and, did, and we were able to create an anesthesiology MVP. And that basically MVP also have to support the transitional to digital quality measures. This was the MVP value pathways that were proposed when they had an R, uh, request for proposals. And you can see we did create an anesthesia one, which is um, which will be available next year. And it does include some of our MIPS, some of our quality improvement measures your Medicare spending per beneficiary, which your hospitals get already, and it will also include a foundational level, which is likely to be readmissions. This is um, showing up close the level of granular detail. This really shows how MVPs for anesthesiologists will be linked to hospital outcomes in the future. So basically, this will be the foundational level. Along the tab here, you can see there'll be the quality, which is MIPS, the improvement activities that you can choose to participate in from a large menu, cost, which we are working now with CMS to create better cost measures, but most of this is the hospital cost on the patient's inpatient stay, and then the foundational level, including um, hospital, for example, hospital-wide readmissions, and also um, hospitalized uh, admission rates for chronic conditions in general, what's called hospital-wide. So again, going to link us as anesthesiologists close to house, how hospital outcomes. And this just shows you the timeline. We've already started here in 2023. Next year, it will be available. You'll be able to, vol to voluntarily report. And then we will continue to develop new um, MVPs that will provide more access for more anesthesiologists. And then this will continue to go on. The goal ultimately is to transition away from MIPS as they're known currently into MVPs. That being said, there still will be a need for the MIPS or the individual quality measures to be part of the MIPS value pathways. By the way, as if you didn't know this from your own practices or talking to people, quality, reporting quality measures is very costly. So another criticism of the program that will not get easier with MIPS, MVPs, or either way you do it, APMs also spend a significant amount of money reporting these quality measures, as do hospitals. So as I said earlier, there's four parts to Medicare. We've talked a little bit about MIPS and anesthesiologists in Part B, that's your physician reimbursement. Let's move now to hospital part A, which is the hospital part. And this is where we need to get together as anesthesiologists and hospitals, and this is where a lot of the Medicare money goes. Hospitals get part A payments, um, and the hospital value-based uh, payment program is now part of, is now important, and it's been revised. It's important to remember with hospitals, it's reimbursement, and we'll talk about those programs. It's also reputation which is very important to hospitals that drives patients and drives the market to them. CMS has several reimbursement programs. These are the value-based purchasing programs, which is at risk of 2% of DRGs. So what this means is if I was going to pay you $10,000, for example, for an inpatient stay and an elective, say a hip, it's probably more, but it's just use 10,000. If I have a penalty, it's going to be potentially less 2,000, so I may only less, sorry, 2%, so that I'm going to be knocked down a little bit from my 10,000, I'll get only 9,000 9, something. And then if I also happen to pick up a C diff along the way, I'll get another 1% day. 
And then if I happen to readmit the patient, I may get another day. That could be 6%. These are real dollars, real numbers that cost the hospitals a lot. And it's really important for hospitals, and they work, most hospitals work hard behind um, the scenes to try to prevent these quality events, these never events from happening, and to work learn constantly on the different drivers of this. So the value-based hospitals have to require to earn it back, and the hospital acquired hack one um, is just a penalty only. You just lose one percent just the way it is, and uh, readmission is also penalty only. And the hard thing about these programs is they're not this year. So I'm in 2022 now. We are still getting penalties back from 2018, 2019. So it's hard to change things going forward. You have to be very patient. And this is hard for hospitals because it, it affects my cash income now, even though it was something that happened two or three years ago. The value-based domains that you need to think about are clinical outcomes. This tends to be mortality after MIs, pneumonias, cabbages, certain are all, these are all prescribed. Uh, person and community engagement, this tends to be your HCAP scores, you know, those press gainy, um, the surveys that go out are so important for the hospitals. How did, did anyone ask the call bell? How was the MD communication? These are really important to hospitals. Safety, did anybody fall? Did anybody have a pressure ulcer? Um, again, stuff we're not thinking of as anesthesiologists, but if you're looking for your hospital to get extra support or supporting the mission of your hospital, this is all chipping away at it. The hospital, um, this is the Acquired Conditions Reduction Program. Um, this is domain one and domain two. The ones we're most familiar with in the surgical anesthesia world tend to be CDIs, CLABSIs, CAUDIs. Um, these are very, these are huge penalties. They impact everything. If you have a couple of central line infections or a couple of catheter associated UTIs, it hurts your hospital enormously financially and it goes on for years. Um, the expectation from your hospital is you'll have very few. So even three or four or five seems like a small number when you're in a busy hospital that can really hurt you financially and reputation. Domain one, I feel that these things, things like iatrogenic pneumothoraxes, post-opter perioperative hemorrhage, again, not common, but they can definitely hurt you. These are the patient safety indicators that contribute to the HACC program. The hospital readmission program, I think this is where the most bang for the buck. This was started in 2010, um, and a, basically a significant reduction in DRG payments for hospitals who have readmissions within 30 days. Heavily weighted towards joint patients, but impacts all hospital-wide readmissions. And the penalties are calculated up to 3%. I'm at a small hospital. We had a bad few years of readmissions back in 2017, 16, about that time. We've paid about $800,000 for that in a penalty, and it's publicly reported. So these are hard reputation numbers, and they're hard financial numbers. Um, these are underneath here, um, acute MI, CHF, pneumonia, COPD, knee and hip, and cabbage are the big ones, and you get weighted for those. It does depend on you having a minimal amount of uh, patients to participate in. Um, you have to reach a certain threshold. This is a little bit too much detail, but I think this is important for us to understand as anesthesiologists when we're looking at things like perioperative or preoperative workup and how do we contribute to the medical record and documentation and acuity of the patient. Basically, Medicare expects you to have a certain number of predicted re predicted readmission rates. This is the actual um, admission rate. This is the expected readmission rate. So you can see in this example how it was over one for THAs and um, for hips and knees, which means there's a penalty assigned. For an acute MI, it was under one, so there was no penalty assigned. So you can, and in fact, the first few years of the reduction in the readmission program were felt to be because hospitals understood that they needed to improve their um, diagnostic accuracy and their acuity and they're basically charting so that their, pre, their, their expected readmission rate more accurately reflected the acuity of your patients. And this is so true for so many of the Medicare um, hospital penalties and quality programs is they're looking at their risk adjusting based on your charting. So if your patient looks very healthy because 
it's inaccurately charted that they had heart failure or independent diabetes or other major Medicare comorbidities, you may get hit with unexpected penalties. So this is an opportunity, I think anesthesia has an opportunity to discuss with your hospital, how can we help in terms of our electronic record charting on getting some of those preoperative workups we've done, we have done into the chart so that the patient is appropriately scored and risk assessed. This is just some examples. I don't know if any of you follow Becker's, but this comes up on a lot of tweets and a lot of um, emails. And I've been called by a board member when we hit the top 25 uh, top 25 hospitals for readmissions. So there is a lot of discussion of 39 hospitals, Medicare readmissions, millions of dollars, and Medicare cuts payments to over 700 hospitals over patient complications. Again, buried into those hack readmissions and BDP programs. It's also important to remember about readmission, re reputation. This also counts for hospitals. CMS, in a couple of years ago, they revamped. It used to be Hospital Compare. Now it's Care Compare. Basically, this is the tool. This is where patients go. They go to look up their hospital. They go to look up their provider. For hospitals in particular, a lot of those scores, the value-based scores from value-based hacks, um, counties, excessive complications, mortality, all weigh into how you score on the Medicare.gov um, Medicare site. And patients use this, and they can find out information also about you as an individual physician. As anesthesiologists, we're often a little bit silent, but if you're a pain provider or out there, um, it may be more relevant. But again, patients look at these websites, our value-based care, all that kills us on the websites if we're doing poorly. You may have heard of Hospital Stars. This is the five-star quality rating that was introduced a couple of years ago by CMS. Um, again, one of these things is all over your website, all over the news, when a patient, when a family member is deciding whether to come to your hospital or not for a, re, for a surgery, they're going to see are you a three-star, four-star, or five-star hospital. And the five, it was created for healthcare consumers, but it's also vital since patients do look at this and it can attract more patients. The tricky part about star ratings is it's based on 57 measures. It's not always the same. My hospital might choose 50, you know, 35 different measures than another hospital. And in addition, low volume hospitals that might be doing hip replacements at a very low volume, it may not impact their quality star score, but it might be very important. As we all know, high volume does tend to improve patient outcomes. Um, and, but that may not be reflected in things like the STAR um, ratings. So again, tricky to interpret, but patients see it and they're not going to spend a lot of time interpreting it. LeapFrog is another one that's all over. And again, it draws from the same types of measures that the hospital already has. It draws from your patient experience measures, your complication measures, your safety. There's also a lot that goes into LeapFrog scoring that you may or may not be aware of. At the moment, there's a requirement for observations of hand hygiene. When you're going in and out of rooms, whether if you're up on an inpatient floor, the emergency room, or if you're in one of the procedural-based areas. There is, there is um, a tabulation on whether the hands were washed before, that in, before the, somebody went into the patient's room and when they came out. Not just physicians, physicians, nurses, techs, everyone. And they, these are the types of granular data that go into the leapfrog score. And as we all know, a score of A is something that's splashed everywhere. And it can be sometimes challenging um, to get. But it's important if you want to be a leader in your quality in your hospital, understand what goes into leapfrog and how can you help as an anesthesiologist in the operating room or the perioperative space often one of the busiest spaces in the hospital. Hospitals also, it's favorable for them to engage in quality initiatives such as high reliability organization. I don't know if any of you have participated in this. They will often bring leaders in the hospital, chiefs of service, division chiefs together to work on the leadership culture and to work on the culture in the hospital. Where pre and, it, and it's, we've done this in our own hospital. It's fascinating. It's a lot of work, but it does change the way you look at events, the way you look at um, events that happen, and the way you drill down to root cause analysis. So again, and hospitals get a favorable rating when things like joint commission come through, 
and they uh, they ask about things like high reliability of, um, opportunity uh, organizations and what your organization might be doing to participate. So summary, when we're looking at CMS dollars, anesthesiology, and hospitals, there's a lot of dollars that go into this. This just slide just illustrates in uh, turquoise the penalties that went to hospitals in millions, so, and then the number of hospitals penalized. And you can see that there's a significant amount of dollars each year being withheld and going into penalties um, that are opportunities to, to do better with better quality. So finally, just to end, my take-home points today are the CMS pay-for-performance programs are, evol for, are evolving to the MIPS value pathway program. So we're going to move away from individual merit-based individual MIPS scores for physicians towards the value-based ones, which intertwine the hospital quality scores. This is new and different and coming and it's getting more and more linked each year. So this will link our hospital payments. You're going to care more now about what is your readmission rate as it may impact now the MIPS um, financial rewards coming back. Hospitals face significant financial risk from BBP payments, from um, hospital acquired conditions, and from the HACC programs and readmission penalties. And it behooves you as anesthesiologists to understand what hospitals are penalized for. Where are their weak programs? Where do they need assistance in their quality programs that you as an anesthesiologist can help with? And also, it also helps with your patient's experience and your patient's quality and outcome. I didn't talk much about it, but patient experience is a huge driver on everything. It impacts VVPs, it impacts the, um, your star value, your star ratings, it impacts your lead for broad scores. Patient experience is mostly derived from the press gainy um, surveys that go out to patients randomly after they've been in the hospital. You can ask your hospital if you can have access to these comments. You can see how patients felt after their inpatient stay or their emergency room visit. You can see your ambulatory scores and whether they understood the anesthesia education. You can influence your hospital as to what they're asking, looking for. But patient experience is huge and it matters. And it's an enormous driver of all of these penalty and quality programs. Again, anesthesiology can exist by participation in hospital quality initiatives, in high reliability training, and knowing reputational risks. Anesthesiologists are leaders in patient safety. It's been well shown. And, and with programs such as the perioperative surgical home, we've also shown that we're leaders in clinical pathways and efficiency. And this is a place where anesthesiologists can really participate in the hospital. Go to your quality directors, go to your chief medical officer, ask what you can do. In a, in, your, in a small space to get to improve the quality and the efficiency for your hospital, it will be valued. So anesthesiologists, as I sort of said this already, contributes by leading evidence-based care. Um, what we can also do is the top 10 earners in hospitals are things like cardiac surgery, orthopedics, GI programs, procedures, general surgery. These are what are the top earners for hospitals. These are the val hospitals value their surgeons orthopedists. They value anesthesiologists, but we can make ourselves even more valuable by making these programs seamless, by making them efficient and very high quality. So I would say are you, we need to ensure that our top earners like orthopedics, cardiovascular procedure services thrive in our hospitals. When they thrive, our patients thrive. And when our patients and our surgeons and the volume thrives as anesthesiologists, we are also thriving and will do incredibly well in this new vision of, of hospital medicine and quality medicine in the future. So thank you very much. Um, we'll be open for questions later on in the session. Thank you.